Hey, how's it going? It's going good. I yeah, sorry about that. My internet died while I was trying to connect. I'm going to go over here and fix it. I'm on, I'm on my cell date right now. One second. Oh, no worries. So remind me again what the topic is. What are we talking about? Wait. There we go. Sorry. I, I, uh, it did pop up. Um, this introduction, like, why should someone be Mormon? Think just typical introduction stuff. Okay. Why should somebody be Mormon? Yeah, as opposed to anything else. So you got you got Catholic, Catholicism, Protestantism, Greek Orthodoxy, things like that. Right. I, well, I don't think anybody should be Mormon. I think they should be whoever they are. Mormon was a person, so well, I don't think that people should rename themselves or identify as somebody else. Well, let me well, let me rephrase that. Why should someone be part of the LDS Church? Be more maybe a precise question there. Oh, okay. Well, because it's Christ restored church. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hang on. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry, I have a very talkative cat who would like to interrupt me when I'm doing stuff. Ah, ah. Back, back. <laughs> okay, so. So it's part of Christ, so you call it uh, Christ Restored Church, right? Right. Okay. So, uh, what's the uh, like? If someone asked you, why is it? How, how we know it's Christ Restored Church? You know, like why? Why? Why would someone like? How would? How would you answer that question? How do we know that it is? Because it has all of the same indicators. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, yeah. So we believe Christ organized a church. Do you believe that Christ actually mm -hmm. organized a church? He established a church, yes. Okay, right. So we believe that he established a church or organized or however you want to say it. And that when he established that church, it has certain elements to it. And those elements mm -hmm. were lost and they were restored. And the current Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has all of those elements. Okay. And no, so, no, no other church not only has them, but even claims to have them. Well, I'll actually disagree with that statement. But um, what would the so if somebody asked you then, like, what elements were lost? Like, how do we know they were lost? Like, what were the elements that were lost that we can we can we can prove that were lost? Well, let me <laughs> let me ask you this question real quick. Do you believe the Bible okay. is a closed canon of scripture? No. Okay, you believe in an open canon? Yes, more or less. Uh, um, base, base, now, I was raised Reformed. The Reformed believe the canon's closed, but I also been looking at Orthodoxy, and they believe it's open. After consideration, I would say it's an open canon. Okay. If God wants, if God wants to have more revelation, he has a right to do so. Okay. And so it, if God were to add revelation, what, what, what is the method by which he would do that? Well, he would. Well, usually, he, if he sends revelation, he'll either he generally sends it in the form of prophet. He'll he'll pick somebody, and then they will give out revelation, and then the church would study his word with the scriptures and see if it lines with what scripture teaches. If it does, and his prophecies come to pass, or before say he performs some miracles, and they see this is okay, this is truly from God, then his works we put into scripture. Okay, so if somebody were to come along and say, "I'm a prophet," I am telling you things that are new and that are not contained in prior revelations would those things be acceptable it would depend on the circumstances i would say but now like if he started like performing miracles and what he was teaching doesn't contradict it doesn't have to be necessarily be an old scripture but it doesn't contradict old scripture then it can be open for consideration. Because if he says something like, hey, Jesus was a woman, well, obviously we do nothing as a heretic. That's obviously not true. Okay. And so we, we believe that that structure by which revelation is received was, was accomplished through the organization of the, the apostles with James and Peter being the chief apostles and each directing the church. And that's what we see in the New Testament. 
So there was a pattern by which an authorized person received permission or authority to receive revelation for the church. And we believe that 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 pattern by which revelation or additional information was added to the church was lost and it had to be restored. Well, I would uh, well, I'll ask two questions. One, um, is it Hebrews 1 or is it chapter 2? Um, I, 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 if you look at the, look at the verse specific, I can get it for you. But uh, Hebrews says that in the past, God spoke to us through prophets, right? But in these latter days, he speaks to us through his son. Now, I won't, I won't take a hard stance and say that absolutely means no revelation is possible, but it would seem to imply that the age of prophets is over. But the other question I would ask is, uh, you're familiar with Romans, Ephesians, Corinthians, right? These are epistles, right? They're, they're what now? Those are, those are, what are Romans, Ephesians? What are those? Epistles. Letters. Where, where are they found? Well, found in the Bible. Oh, okay. Okay. So they're, they're books from the Bible. Mm-hmm. So who, who, are these, who are these books written to? I would imagine if they're called Romans, Ephesians, and those, they're written to those people living in those areas, I would imagine, right? Right. But they're written to other churches. They're written to the church. Basically, they're, they're addressing, like, Galatians, for example, Paul was writing Galatians because he was addressing a problem to Galatians who were trying to conform to, like, old law, circumcision. And he's trying to tell them, hey, you don't need to do this. And so these are written to other churches. So there's other churches, they would have already had ordained priests. In fact, one of the two one of the two earliest priests that we know of by name is Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp, both of which were disciples of John the um, the, the the apostle, you know, one the, the one that was at Jesus' crucifixion that Jesus talked to and said, Behold thy mother, behold thy son. Um, he had two early disciples, both Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp, and they were both ordained priests. This discussion with the missionaries two weeks ago, and then again, you're, you're, two days ago, you're, you're cutting out. Pretty, you're cutting out pretty bad, William. What What are you saying that? Uh, uh, let, let me let me try read. Let me try my turn. Give me a second. Give me a second. <coughs> One second. Uh, one second i'm sorry my internet's being stupid (laughs) let me let me before we get into the to the whatever you were saying about john and polycarp and saint ignatius or whatever um let me address the 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 hebrews whatever you were saying from hebrews so what what are you saying that that verse means or passage means? Well, I don't want to take a hard stance on it until I've properly discussed it. But when you have when the verse is saying that in the past God spoke to us through prophets, but in these latter days He speaks to us through a Son, which would, which doesn't necessarily say hey no more prophets, but it would imply that we don't have a need for them anymore. Now I'm not saying that God can't raise a prophet if He so chooses. It's just in the mainstream Christianity belief, there's not really a need for it at this point. Right. So, so I would ask you, I would ask you if that's the interpretation of that passage from the, the, the epistle to the Hebrews, right? Mm-hmm. Who's writing it? Hebrews, um, the mainstream belief is written by Paul. Uh, well, okay. and, Paul still- and Paul is what? Paul's an apostle. Okay, so I I don't know that that interpretation works. Was was Hebrews the last text of the Bible? Uh, no, that was Revelation. That was written by John in the uh, late 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 first century, around the nineties. It was written by a John, yes. No, it was written by John the Apostle. He he identifies himself as such, I think, in the opening chapter. He yeah, Revelation is probably not written by John because the Greek that it's written in is very poor, and it's very different from the book of the Gospel of John. 
Now, we have no idea whether or not John wrote the Gospel of John. That's just a historical well, attribution based on tradition. Well, no, actually, Even John, though, actually, and I know for sure, one second, I'll read this to you. So we get to John here. It's actually the last chapter of John. So what we read here in John, it says, right in John uh, chapter 21, verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know his testimony is true. And he, right here it says, uh, where's the, where it's just the beginning of here, hang on. Right here it says, then Peter turning and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had learned on his breast and at supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betray you, yada, yada, that says, this is a disciple who testifies these things and wrote these things. We know his testimony is true. And we traditionally know that John, the, the disciple that Jesus loved was John. He's the one that Jesus turned to at the crucifixion and said, Behold thy mother, woman, behold thy son. I believe he didn't find himself in Revelation. One second. I could be wrong. Uh, by, the, by the way, the, the point of this discussion, I'm, I'm not trying to like destroy you or whatever. I'm here, I'm here to gain knowledge and learn, not, not to win arguments. Right, no, no, and I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not. Well, and my, my job is, is not to, to engage in an argument. My, my job is to, to actually try to identify what we can identify. So, for example, um, the disciple whom Jesus loved in the texts was Lazarus. Well, Lazarus didn't write John, though. There's no, there's no historical evidence for that whatsoever. Except it says that it was written by the disciple whom Jesus loved, and in the text that was Lazarus. No, that was John. Um, hang on. Where, I'll, I'll to. So, yeah, so where is the passage that says John is the disciple whom Jesus loved? Uh, mind you, Lazarus wasn't really a disciple of Jesus. He didn't start coming around much later. One second. I, I'm sorry. John was not a disciple of Jesus, or Lazarus was not a disciple of Jesus. I don't believe so. Well, he wasn't an apostle of Jesus. That's that's for certain. If he wasn't one of the apostles, they said that I know of. Uh, well, it indicates that he was the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? Yeah, so 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 you have six times in the Gospel of John, uh, on chapter twenty, verse two. That would be that's the one that is read to you, I believe. Yeah, so you might want to look through the Gospel of John, focus on chapters ten through thirteen, and identify which which disciple is the one that's identified as the one Jesus loved in the John text. It's Lazarus. So the, the attribution of John being the, the author of the of, of the Gospel of John is a historical to traditional attribution. Not there's no certainty to that. And then the, the problem with saying well, that John well, well just let me finish. The, the, the problem with saying that John wrote Revelation is Revelation is written in very, very bad Greek. And the Gospel of John is written in very good Greek. That, that, that give you don't take your word on it because I I don't know anything about the Greek in Revelation, um, right? So scholars do not believe. No scholar believes that the that the author of Revelation is also the author of John. Well, well, well yeah. and, and they, they separate them out as John of Patmos, and if it's the Gospel of John, most people actually call it the most scholars call it the fourth gospel because they're not certain who wrote it. I would. Um, we don't. We don't really know who wrote any of the gospels, but. Well, we know Matthew wrote Matthew because it had because because the language is used in it. Not only that, but there's only two. There's only two gospels that were acts that we that the Church of Firms that was written by the apostles themselves. That's John and Matthew. Mark was actually Peter's testimony, but it was written by Mark, who's probably a scribe, and Luke was written by Paul's scribe. Right. Those are the traditional arguments for their authorship. Yes, I'm aware of those. And the problem with them is, is that those are just arguments. They're, they're arguments based on circumstantial evidence. They're based on arguments that were made by early church fathers, but they're not, there's no evidence to, to clarify one way or the other, whether or not the attributions of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are correct. Well, let me ask you a question. 
I mean, the only thing that anybody can can affirm is we don't know who wrote them. Well, let me ask you two if questions. You want to believe, if you want to believe that they were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, our church maintains they were probably written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We accept the traditional attributions, but the reality of it is, is nobody knows. Well, that goes back to the question. We don't know who wrote Julius Caesar's work. He claims to be Julius Caesar. I, I don't but... really care who. I don't really care who wrote Julius Caesar's work. Well, you're missing the point. The point is who, who you trust on, on scripture, the church or secular atheists. I don't trust atheists. I think I think they lie. You know, you know, it, it it's. You well, know, here, here's how I work it out. I don't trust anybody. And so I just I work things out and, and I, I decipher from the evidence that's available to me what what I should believe and trust in. So I, I don't I don't designate that somebody has. So, for example, uh, a secular atheist, for example, would have no motive for making a theological claim, but somebody who belongs to a religious organization is going to have a specific motivation for a specific thing that they would say or do. So for example, if I'm a, of a person who believes in the Trinity, then when I read the Bible or I decipher the text of the Bible, then I'm gonna interpret Trinity in it. Yeah, it's called Isa Jesus. R right, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with biblical hermeneutics. So the issue with it is, is that with respect to that type of, of methodology, where a theologian is, is drawing theological premises from the texts, right? A, a secular atheist, for example, is not going to do that because they don't care. They're gonna just look at the text from the historical perspective, and they're gonna identify the factual arguments that can be, that can be identified from history. That, that's the assumption that the secular atheist doesn't have an agenda. There are many secular atheists who actually have been proven wrong repeatedly and refuse to change their position, like Bart Ehrman, for example. He refused to change his position. He's been proven wrong by countless textual te textual historians. He, he often claims that we have no idea who wrote the Gospels. And uh, James White put out there, he he's actually has a major in-textual analysis and says, you're wrong. We can, we can right, and, and, Yeah, and James White's a theologian. And I, I again, I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't give much credibility to James White because most of the books he writes about Mormonism are factually incorrect. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the um, well. What, what, what does Mormonism teach you, for example, on God? Now, I already know the answer, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Right. So we we reject the Trinity, and we believe mm -hmm. we believe in a, a rational theology that the Father and the Son are separate entities or beings. Not person, not not simply just separate persons. Okay. Well, the well, tritheism. Well, I know you don't care much because you know because you don't you're not probably apostolic church. But tritheism was actually condemned in the second, the late early sorry early third century by Tertullian first, and it was officially condemned at Nicaea, Constantinople, if, if, if you just. However, that's actually that's actually not a biblical position either. If we look at Isaiah and through chapters 43, 44, and forty five. Yeah, if God repeatedly says there is no other gods, I am the only God. I can pull the first stuff for you. And then later in John one, it is the God. So you have two ver you have actually multiple verses in the Old Testament saying, "I am the only God." There is no other gods. And then you go to John, which says Jesus is God, but the Father is also God. So how, how familiar are you with ancient with the beliefs in ancient ancient Israel and a bunch of the, among the Hebrews? I wouldn't be able to give you a number on that. Well, how, how are you familiar with them? Have you studied ancient Israelite history? I have a book over here in my chest. Over the, problem, the, problem, the problem with a lot of people who read the Bible and, and they, they interpret the Isaiah passages, for example, in that manner, is they're actually imposing monotheism on a, on a culture that doesn't hold or ascribe to monotheism. The Israelites were definitely monotheistic. Hero Israel, the Lord, our God, Lord is one. Is is one? What does that mean? Yeah, it, yeah, echad. Yeah, he is one. He is echad. Do you know what echad means? Oh, the Godhead. Yes. Yeah, but what does echad mean? Yeah, that's all. It's about being one in purpose. I, 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 I'm familiar with the Mormon argument. Um, yeah. we, are, we are one. We are unified. Yeah, it's right here. It's New International, Isaiah 45, 5. I am the Lord, and there's no no other apart from me. There is no God. There's another one that says, there's no God before me, nor should be formed in any form after me. That's 4310. Yeah. So let's yes. talk about Isaiah 4310. Mm -hmm. 
And so your interpretation of the text is that it is strictly monotheistic, right? It's actually, it's actually not my interpretation. That's the interpretation of the church. I'm not, I'm not I don't, my yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really care about what a so you don't speak for any church i don't speak okay. for mormon church you can only speak for yourself right well i'm i'm just relaying what the church teaches i'm not when you say the that church what are you talking about the apostolic church i'm talking about like the orthodoxy uh, catholicism these these these, these the apostolic churches that christ founded now granted i have a Catholicism. are you a but, member of the greek orthodox or the roman no. catholic church no that's that's irrelevant though I mean, it doesn't matter if I'm part of the church or not, you know, teach, you know, but technically. Right, you're, right, you're, you're, yeah, so your your argument's not very linear. I'm not following it. So are you, are you, are you telling us what William believes or are you telling us what somebody else believes? I'm talking about the church believes. I'm not, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I don't care what the church believes. I care what William believes. What I believe, well, so I, you're, I would you're talking. Believe. You and I are talking. Travis is talking to William. I don't care what somebody else believes. I want to know what William believes. Mm -hmm. so saying, saying this organization, right? Saying this organization believes something. It, it, so I can look up a book or Google a website and find out what I, I've studied the Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic Church for many years. I, I know what they believe. I'm not really concerned. And I mean, if, if you're just going to tell me what they believe, I can. I know that already. Okay, well, I, I would say I have to agree with the position then, because okay, so you so it's what you believe. Okay, so what do you believe? Uh, I believe that God is a triunity. I believe there is only one God. I don't believe we're going to become little gods later on. I do believe that God gave us a church. I believe God preserves His church. I think it's a, I think it's a major theological problem. It's also anti-biblical to claim that the church disappeared for, for eighteen hundred years. And not only that, when Justin came along, he actually rejected the idea right, that William, God was right. shh, shh, Hey, 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 calm, calm down, because you're going, you're going, what you did is you went through like four different topics. And so kind of slow it down a little bit. We're still talking about Isaiah 43.10 and what Isaiah 43.10 means. So what is your interpretation of Isaiah 43.10? Well, it says, um, hang on, let me go back here so I can quote it correctly. I am the Lord, and the, oh, not that one. Oh, yes, that, that was forty. That was forty-five. Five. What am I doing? One second. I'm sorry. I say uh, forty-three ten. Forty. Oh, this is not. But oh yeah, this one. Okay. Before me, there was no God, uh, nor there shall be any after me. That means to me that that before there was, okay, there was only one God. In the beginning, there was only one God, and then in the end, there should only be one God. If you actually look at the other text, that seems to support that. Okay, so, so monotheism would indicate that there actually is no divine beings aside from the one God. Do you agree with that? Or are you no. a little bit more liberal in your construction that there are other divine beings that exist? Well, it depends on you defining divine, but there are other angelic heavenly beings. We have seraphim, we have cherubim, you know, the angels and all that stuff. But as for gods, in, in an ontological sense, there's only one God. And there only will be one God. Okay, so so I I would agree in the sense that there is God, that there's only one God. Joseph Smith didn't teach that, though. I'm sorry? Joseph Smith didn't teach that, though. In the King Follett sermon, he talked about there's multiple gods. That would have been the sermon in the Grove, but... Um, it's King Follett's sermon. I can pull it up for you. And I could quote it for you. So the, the point being is that it's the sermon in the Grove that talks about the plurality of gods, not the King Follett sermon. Well, I know the King Paul sermon says that you have you have believed that God was God for all eternity. I'm here to what was it pull down the veil so you may see whatever. Which actually, you know, I, their view on the Trinity is more logical, but their view on creation is not. Because when you get to the teaching that God that the universe is an eternal place and that God wasn't God for all eternity, you actually run into a a, a logical and mathematical problem. You see, the universe is a. The, I'm sorry. Ahead. Do you 
Do you think that Joseph Smith was teaching that God wasn't always God? That's what he says. You thought you, I've come, you come to believe that God was God for all eternity. I've you know, come to pull on the bills you may see. <laughs> right. So that's not if that's how you understood that that passage, then then you're you're incorrect. But let's talk about Isaiah forty three ten real quick. So God created all the other angelic beings, correct, including right. Lucifer. Right. So God created Satan. Yes. Okay, why did he create Satan? Satan so can't create anything else for his own glory. Okay, so the existence of Satan glorifies God. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the, why did why did God make Satan the the god of this world? He didn't. Okay, so Second Corinthians four four. Can you mm -hmm. if you've got the so access to that? Talking, I'm talking about the word calls God, Satan the god of the god of this world. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, do you? How do you interpret that then? Okay. So basically, because we have to understand when we read scripture, we we, we can't we, we can't ignore verses. Obviously, we have to be able to patch it all into one beautiful mosaic, right? So we have verses. Wait, 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 wait. Why do we have to do that? Because God doesn't contradict Himself. No, but you're assuming that what God wrote the Bible. I would find the well. He didn't write the Bible. It's Theonostos, you know, God breathed. But I would think it's a major theological problem to doubt the scriptures. Why? Because if the scriptures aren't inspired, then we can't trust them, and then we can't trust anything God says because they're written by men. In fact, we can't. We can't. We can't trust the Book of Mormon. They are. They are written by men. Well, we, we, the, the problem with your statement there is we can't trust the Book of Mormon because it was written by Joseph Smith. He translated them allegedly. But we can't prove they came from God. He, he, God didn't just throw them down from the heavens and all to see these golden tablets well, coming I mean, down from heaven. Well, so now you're making a different argument. <laughs> and I, I guess no. so. So now you're you're presupposing what? You're presupposing that by, that God wrote the Bible. It's God breathed. Yes, that, And that means what? What does God breathe mean? So for me, me. God breathed means a human being decided to write something down and in the process of writing it down he was asking god to inspire him as to what to write for a specific circumstance well, the holy spirit the holy spirit comes upon them and inspires them to write yes right and so does that mean that everything they write is is factually and practically correct yes okay so a person can't write incorrectly while they're inspired by the holy spirit no Okay, so the Bible uh, is, so you believe the Bible is without any errors or contradictions, right? I won't say errors, because there are, there, are, there are textual variations. Well, how that, could there be if, if... Because there's nothing, there's nothing in Scripture that says God, that God's going to preserve his word down to every dot, to the letter, we're not Muslims here. The, the lettering doesn't save, the message does. And so, while the while the lettering may change, and the wording may change, the message does not change. You know, it's kind of like, oh. for example... I, I, let's say a monk, you know, in, in ancient, you know, you know, Rome, writing uh, the New Testament down, and he actually takes an insert from Matthew and puts it in Mark. That's a, that's a corruption of the text, but it doesn't change the message, right? Okay, yeah, right. So the general message of the Bible is what you're saying is preserved, right. not necessarily right. right. So so Paul, for example, could write something that's incompatible with something that Peter wrote, assuming no. assuming those authors. But as long as the message, generally speaking, is the same, they can make those mistakes. There can, there can be some t mistakes in terms of like, you know, let's say a copying error, like someone actually put a punctuation in the wrong place or numbered something wrong or whatever. But the, but the, but the messages, for example, you're talking about Satan being the God of the world and God saying there's only one God. These messages cannot contradict. So we had to find a way to reconcile them. Why right? can't they? Well, because if because if God says, and it minds you, when God says that this is actually God saying this, it's right, not. That's, I, and that's, that's what I'm saying is it's not. Isaiah is not God saying. Isaiah is somebody writing and suggesting right. that God inspired him to write this. Well, actually, hang on. Before I misquote and Isaiah, Paul, here, me... Paul in Second Corinthians four, chapter four, first four, chapter four, verse four, is Paul representing that this is what God told him. Um, no, I think in Isaiah, hang on. Oh, well, no, no, and, and you understand, William, that's what you would have to believe, right? You you don't have any evidence that God actually dictated the Bible, do you? 
uh, yes, there's a lot of prophecies that came true, and it, it wouldn't come true if they were not being divinely inspired. Which, for example, name I, one I, prophecy. I, name one prophecy you believe was 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 given and actually occurred. Okay, <laughs> give me one second. And, uh, and, I, and I fail to see how. Yeah, this this is actually a book you're not familiar with because it's it's deuterocanonical. But uh, one second. But I think when you hear this, I think you'll. Uh, I'm sorry. Which book or which I, book am I not? I really, I really need thumb thumb tabs in this. Which book am I not familiar with? Uh, Wisdom of Solomon. Oh, okay. Well, you might be. Maybe you are. Maybe maybe maybe, maybe being presumptuous. Um, eight ninety three. I'm gonna read this to you, and. Uh, I want you to um, get your thoughts on it. 893. So I'm almost there. We're with them, Sorry, I, this thing really needs some thumb tabs. I hate Bibles without them. It makes finding these things so much harder. That's song of songs. I need songs. Oh, I passed, passed it. Okay, so here we go. Wisdom of Solomon. So we went to chapter two here. Okay. All right. Let us lie in ambush for the righteous man, because he is useless to us and opposes our deeds. He denounces us for our sins against the law and accuses us of sins against our upbringing. He claims to have knowledge of God, and he calls himself the child of the Lord. He has become for us a refutation of our purposes. Even seeing him is a burden to us because his life is unlike that of others. For his paths go in a, dif in a different direction. We are considered by him as a hybrid and he avoids our way as something immoral. He considers the last things of the righteous as blessed and pretends that God is his father. Let us see if his words are true. Let us put these last things to the test at the end of his life. For if this righteous man is the son of God, he will help him and deliver him from the hand of those who oppose him. Let us test him with insult and torture that we may know his gentleness and test his patience and endurance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death for there shall be visitations because of his words. That's a reference to the crucifixion, is it not? Sounds like it. Let's go to the crucifixion where here. Say, where does it say that it's a reference to Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth's crucifixion that occurred in? There's a scene that act, there's a scene in the, in the Bible here that actually quotes that that verse when no, they're but, talking but about. What specifically in what you read references Jesus of Nazareth or his crucifixion? Oh, let me go back to it. One second. So I'm going. I'll try to go to the uh, reference in the in the New Testament because there's a scene where basically with the, with, the, with the Pharisees are calling out saying, you know, if he if he truly is, you know, let, let God come down and save him. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, it's like for the right man, so God, He will help him. He'll deliver him from the hands of those who oppose him. It talks about. Uh, hang on, I get to this. I, I do have one more question while you're thinking that maybe you can answer it without being distracted. Where is the wisdom of Solomon in the Bible? Uh, it's not in the Protestant canon. It's, it's, it's in the Catholic and in the Orthodox canon. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it, 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 was, it was disputed for a while. Um, it was uh, put into canon, I want to say, in the Council of Carthage. And it's been disputed for a while with the, it's been, but it's been the Orthodox canon since then, but it's been in and out of the Catholic canon, if I remember correctly, though it was officially canonized permanently at the Council of Trent. Okay. But, but we, we, I think we both agree Catholicism is not, um, there's just problems with Catholicism. Like their, their, their doctrines on purgatory are not biblical whatsoever. There's nothing to reference that in scripture or, or tradition. <coughs> yeah. I'm not going to stop you from making arguments that, that, I, I, I can give you. I can give you more if you want more prophecies. You know, there is one prophecy. Well, I'm, I'm still. I'm still not understanding that prophecy because I didn't see. I didn't hear a reference to Jesus of Nazareth. I didn't hear a reference to his being crucified. I didn't see any understanding that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, or I, I, I'm, I'm not. I guess I didn't follow it. Okay, so there's a part in there where it says, you know, let let's see if God will help him. Right? Just like you know, it talks about you know. He's being, he's being, this guy, I, I, what I'm paying an image of when I'm reading this is there's a man who these people hate. He's being put to death because he's and claiming. How to be, is the man identified in the passage? What's he called? Well, he's, he called himself, he's called himself the son of God. Okay. So the son of God. Uh -huh. Yeah. And he, he's being put to death. And there's a scene in this, why I read to you. I can, I can go back and read it to you. 
where the Pharisees or well, whoever these people are, even they identify themselves, are saying, let us see if God will help him or save him, depending on the translation you're using. But there's a scene, I'm, I'm, I guess it's in the Testament here, when he's being crucified and they're calling out to him saying, let, let God come down and save him, you know, so we may see and believe. Or let Christ come down and see and believe, talk about he saved others, let him save himself. And they're mocking him, right? They're mocking this person. It's like, for example, in Psalm twenty, in Psalm uh, twenty-two, for example, remember when Jesus cried out, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" Well, if you go to Psalm twenty-two, it's talk about Psalm by saying, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" And in the Psalm, it's saying they tear my raiment and they throw lots for him, which we see at the crucifixion. Right. So we we do see a lot of those things. That's right. We see a lot of imagery that is taken right. from the Hebrew texts and then right. appears in the Greek texts. Right. And well the, well, the point I'm getting at is, yeah, we do see prophecies being fulfilled, which which would su suggest that these oh, things. We, that's what I'm saying, William. We don't see prophecies being fulfilled. We see an author of the story of Jesus's life referencing aspects of his life and crucifixion and using language from the Hebrew Bible to do it. Okay. I'm not trying to be rude. You're a Christian, right? Because it, it sounds to me like you're no, you're, no. I'm a Latter Day Saint. I've been I've been repeatedly told I'm not a Christian because I'm a Latter Day Saint. So, well, but the reason why, well, I'll we'll get into that later. Um, well, uh, do you well do you think I'm a Christian? E e to be a Christian, you have to accept the Nicene Creed. That's 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 then that's. I'm not, then I'm not a Christian, so no. But, and you need to consider one. Well, because basically, I, I, told, I told these Mormons this the other, the other week. Yeah, because so, so these elders, these elders, they're not Christians either. None of us are Christians. If that's well, your, if that's your definition. Well, the reason why see, I said see, this my so my definition of Christian is somebody who believes in Jesus of Nazareth mm -hmm. and believes that He atoned for their sins. But what's Jesus? The Mormon Jesus or the other Christian Jesus? Yeah, that's, that's, the thing. That's, that's another thing. See, I I I don't do that. I don't believe that there's any other Jesus than Jesus of Nazareth. Well, you have to because you you because let me explain why. So, the nature of your Christ and my Christ is completely different. We believe in a triune Christ. That's part. Of, that's part of the Trinity. Right. We your God is incomprehensible, and mine is not. I understand that. Right, because God is infinite. If I can understand the, three, the infinite God, my three-pound brain, he wouldn't be worshiping now, would he? <laughs> right. I know that your, your God doesn't create very smart people either because they can't comprehend him. God's infinite. Even the angels themselves cover their faces when they look at him because they can't comprehend him. Right. So my, you know, that's if you want to do a, if you'd want to do a my God, your God type of an argument, that's fine. I guess we can do that. Well, well, the, well, deity, you... the, the deity that I believe in, I, I believe gave me an intellect sufficient to comprehend him to the degree that I can. Well, well, I believe reasonable... that, well wait, I, I believe that Jesus of Nazareth as as is evidenced by what we do know about his life that he was a physical reflection of his father and that he was a representation of his father and one of the things that he did was to reflect what his father looked like so i believe that he and his father are physically distinct and they appear like each other well, because well that, that is, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to you know, say, the oh, re you're the reason I believe that is that the concepts that are required to believe in the in the co-substantial triune God are not contained in the Bible, like homoousis, co-substantiality. These these terms and concepts are just foreign to the texts. They're not there. So well, where, where is where is the co-substantial or homoousis of of the triune God? explained anywhere in any passage of any scripture well that's that's what we call exegesis we have to actually look at what scripture teaches as i pointed right. out earlier we have you multiple presuppose types. right you presuppose that isaiah's 46 43 and 45 exactly and etc and passages in deuteronomy okay, okay. are, are <laughs> talking exclusively about monotheism which is not a concept that the ancient Israelites would have even understood. Well, every time they start worshiping more than one God, they, they got punished for it, didn't they? No, anytime um, they got, wait, wait, wait. Anytime they worshiped another God other than the Tetragrammaton, they were punished. Well, well, that, no, doesn't they, mean, that doesn't mean in their minds those other gods didn't exist. It meant that they were only supposed to be worshiping the Tetragrammaton. Right, so they're, so they're, so, so monotheism. It's well, I actually no. I guess you could label that as henotheism. It's My henotheism. Bad. That's what they believe. Okay. 
Okay. Well, so the idea of that idea that in in a in a pagan ancient world, the concept that only one God exists, even the Jews wouldn't have held that position. That's why when they interacted with other peoples, they said our God and your gods. They didn't say your gods don't exist. They just said our God is the superior God. Our God is the the one who sits at the council of the gods. Our God is the one who is over and in charge of things. Our God is better than your God. Kind of a, my dad can beat up your dad type of an argument. Well, I, I will tell you this. Paul actually writes about these other gods, and he says they're not gods, they're demons, as in Corinthians. Is that, yeah, take food from, sorry, they think they're offering food to gods. So I actually don't, I, don't, I, don't, I do not. Let me ask you, let me ask you qualitatively. Let's look at what the qualities of a demon are. Are demons eternal? No. Are they undying? Do they die? Yes. Okay, when are they going to be dead? Do the, they die? The second judgment, the second the judgment and the second death. Okay, so, case of the fire, which is called the second death. Yes. Right, and they'll cease to exist at that point. If, if you're if you're an annihilation, yes. Well, no, I, I'm asking you. I'm not. I'm not. I don't well, believe you can uncreate things. So, if you believe well, that God uncreates stuff, what I'm asking you is, why didn't He uncreate them before all this problem started? Well. Yes. Yeah, well, so God created Satan for His glory to torment human beings, but eventually He's going to no. destroy him. No, He's not created to torment human beings. Oh. Well, God, God, God created Satan as one of the most glorious angels in heaven. God right. gave him free will. Satan chose to use that free will to fall. God respected I, his choice. No, wait, God, wait, wait. So God, after He rebels against God, rather than destroying Him because He what? had rebelled. You said you said, uh, you, you said when God rebelled against God. You mean Satan rebelled against God? No, no, no. I said when when Satan rebelled against God. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. God creates Lucifer. Lucifer becomes Satan. Lucifer became Satan because God placed him on earth. And then, as Paul says in Second Corinthians four four, Satan became the god and the prince and the ruler of this world, which is how he was able to offer Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Right. 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 Well, it, it, but then it also goes about how, how you're defining so God. So if somebody worships, okay. if somebody is worshiping Lucifer, are they worshiping a God? They think they are. I mean, if someone worships this, this can of, well, can of Coke Paul, right here, are Paul they worshiping? They are. Paul would think that they are. No, he said they're demons. No, Paul says he's the God of this world. And he called he call them demons. And well, Jesus I, says he's the ruler I, of this world. I'll call Zeus a God, but I don't think he's an ontological God, same as God. I don't think he's an actual God. I think right. I'll call and that's him. not that's what Isaiah is saying. Isaiah 43 10 is saying, I am God, and I haven't created or formed any other gods that aren't ontologically me. Okay, right? there's other, there's other, hang on a second. Let's he's saying he didn't do what exactly he did. So Isaiah 43 10, as, as you would interpret it based on the way you've explained, God's actually not representing accurately what happened. Because in 43.10, God, if that's who's speaking, says, I didn't create any gods, which, I, and granted, there's no capital letters in Hebrew or Greek, but the reality right. of it is, is the way that the words are conveyed, El or Elohim or Theos, depending on how they're used in, in Isaiah 43.10 and 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, they're the same word. So, so Paul is calling Lucifer or Satan the God of this world, and right. in Isaiah 43, 10, God saying, I never created any gods, but here Lucifer is the God of this world. Right, he's, he's, he was he's created not, by God, so is well, Isaiah 43, 10. I'm trying to make an argument here. The point I'm trying to make, I'll actually read the verse to you quickly. For who foretold this long ago, who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I the Lord? And there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none but me. Turn to me, and you will save all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. There's other verses right. like this, in other parts of the Bible. The right. point I'm getting at is there are many beings in the Bible that are called gods, ranging from objects to spiritual entities like Satan to people. And what God is telling these people is these are not real gods. No, like, what he's okay. saying is they're not me. Hang on. Uh, no, what he's saying is they're not me. I am unique. I am not like them. I am different. Uh, I, am, I am God. I'm the one you're to worship. That's why I Exodus see. 23 is written to say that there, thou shalt have no other gods before me. 
It's yeah. not saying there are no other gods. He's saying don't have any other gods aside from me. We also have right here where it says, um, and it is usually if you want to with this verse, sure. Psalm 82. Yes. I said you will. Yeah, so what? what you're saying is you're saying that that God saying don't worship other gods or beings or anything else means that he's exclusively the only one, which we know because of his creation of Satan is not true. That you but don't Satan believe Satan is like the father, for example. Well, Satan, Satan is not the tetragrammaton. Well, Satan's an angel. Satan's an angel. Okay. Because like it, it, it gets you know, if you want to define God as anyone who calls himself a god, then anyone anything can be a god. To a mic, I'm a god. Obviously, right. I'm not I have but that but that's it's, that, it's that, interesting that, that you've it's interesting that you've just learned a an eternal truth that's taught in Mormonism and you understand right. it now. But if you can redefine anything you want as a god, then God has no meaning. No. What's the meaning? No, God is God, and other beings can become like God if God wills it, can't they? Well, we can become like God, but we won't become God. We won't become little God. Right. We would God. never become God. Why would I ever? How could I ever become God? God is God, and I am me. That's what Joseph Smith said. No, <laughs> you must learn like every God who came before you. <laughs> no, you, your... you have to learn to become gods yourselves, not God. Okay, but the, wait, 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 I didn't hear you. Do you say you, do you say you won't become a come a God or won't become God? I don't become you. God. God will always be oh. God, and God okay. will always be the Father, right. and I will always be in subjection to the Father of spirits. <coughs> that I become like God does not mean I am God. Is so, so Jesus, you believe, so well, do you and believe I see that? that in the representation of Jesus, who okay, being so in you, the form of God. Thought right. it not equal to be to, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, right? Well, he still yes, recognizes anyway. that he is him, and the Father is God. So, wh where where do you stand on on the nature of God? Then is, is he eternal? Has he always existed? Do you believe the universe is an eternal place, or what? Of course, just like it says in the King Follett discourse, God has always been God. Let me make sure I'm quoting this right. You're not, but that's okay. You're quoting part of it correctly, but that's what most people do. We have imagined, yeah, right here. He actually denounces that right here. We have imagined and supposed that God is God from all eternity. Right, I, I know you're going to read part of it rather than all of it. I know. I will repute that idea and take away the veil so that you may right. see. Can you see this screen? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Okay, let me. I don't know if you can see this. Okay, hey, can you see the screen? I don't know if you can see the screen. Yeah, let me rotate my let me rotate my way over here. Let me just do this. There we go. Okay, this is the King Follett sermon. See this? Yeah. Okay. He was a man like us, yea, that God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did. And I will show it from the Bible. The scriptures, wait, the scriptures inform us that Jesus said, as the father hath power in himself, even so hath the Son power to do what? Why? What the Father did. The answer is obvious. In a manner to lay down his body and take it up again. Jesus, what are you going to do? Lay down my life as my Father did and take it again. Right? Right. But where is it saying that God was eternal? Where is it saying he's not? Right here, where it says, you've heard from God, God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take right. away the bills of the truth. So and what's he, what's, what, what, what is he refuting there? Have you read the entire sermon? I have read about the first half. Okay, so if you'll read the entire sermon, this is a funerary text. This is a funeral sermon. That's so irrelevant. Think, what? That's irrelevant. Because it basically, if you if you want to wait, 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 the context of the sermon is irrelevant. 
No, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is whether or not I've read the entire thing or not is irrelevant because if it says this right here, if I'm mistaken. Wait, 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 wait. wait. So if I just don't... read if I just read the first chapter of any any text in the Bible, the rest of it's irrelevant. You're missing the point. The point is, if I'm wrong, you don't need to sit there and say, "Oh, you did the whole thing." Just tell me I'm wrong. Right. I'm, I'm I'm explaining it. So the the King Follett sermon is a funerary. It's a it's a it's a it's a um uh what's the word uh oh the words escape me anyway he's given he's given a sermon at a funeral for king follett king follett was a person he was a member of the quorum of 70 who died he was very well known in the community and he got crushed by a wagon so what he's saying if you'll read the entire sermon is he's saying don't be sad because even god died and was resurrected the same as jesus christ now based on my prior teachings that god has a physical body some of you have believed and supposed that he always had that physical body and i am telling you he did not at wait, some wait. point like the son jesus christ who obtained his physical body god entered into a mortal life laid down his life and took it up again so let me ask you, if a being has the ability to enter into a mortal existence, die, and then resume their life because they have power in themselves to do that, what are they? Are they a I'm, normal person or are they a god? I'm trying to figure out where you're seeing that. that uh, I'm not seeing I just that. read it to you. You read to me the scripture from Formos that you just said, yada, yada, yada. But no, 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 yeah, it's not yada, yada, yada. Okay, but, 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 but before that, you, you get this you get this bit right here before you that. get that you had you had imagined and supposed that God always was alive and had his physical body like he does now. And what that's does say what does it say physical body? That's that what he's clarifying in the subsequent passages. If God was a man the same as Jesus Christ was, it says specifically that, you see it? That God was a man the same as Jesus Christ was. Was well, Jesus God All in right. the flesh? Wait, was right. Jesus God in the flesh? Yes. And then it yes. goes down and it continues to explain that like Jesus, God, when he was a mortal, had power in himself to lay down his life and take it up again. The when same as the son did. Well, besides the fact that God, there's nothing in scripture that ever says that God was mortal. No, I don't know. I, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't say that he wasn't. And as you said at the beginning of this discussion, just because something isn't in the Bible doesn't mean somebody can't add additional clarity or truths to it. Right? Right. Where is it incompatible with the Bible that God has a physical body? John 4. I'll pull, pull the verse. Hang on. John 4, 24. No, it's Old Testament. And make sure that remember when you're talking Old Testament, you're talking about the Tetragrammaton, who is Jesus of Nazareth, who did not have a physical body. No, oh, there's there's there, there's a verse in the any in the, Old Testament the, passage is going to be referring to Christ before he was born, and he would not have had a physical body; it would have been a spirit. That's also in Ether chapter three, because Ether chapter three, the Lord appears to the brother of Jared twenty six hundred years before his birth. And of course, he doesn't have his physical body. So he says, this is the body of my spirit. I'm a spirit. So Old Testament passages don't work. I, um, well, well, what passage would work? No passage would work. There is no passage in any of the Bible that says God doesn't have a physical body. No passage. Well, I, no, there is some numbers. God, God, God unless, you, unless you believe Jesus isn't God, because Jesus has a physical body of flesh and bone. No, he's God. God has a body. In the Old Testament, into incarnated in the New Testament. I'm sorry? God had no body in the Old Testament. He had a body in the New yeah, Testament. Yeah, Jesus had no body. Jesus had a body of spirit in the Old Testament because he's the Tetragrammaton. He was right. the God. By my name, Yahweh, was I not known in Exodus. Right? Right. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob thought they were talking to the God El, but they weren't. They were talking to me. And I am the Tetragrammaton. I am. He says that again, right, in John 8. Uh huh. So Jesus didn't have his body until he was born. Right. 
So any passage where God says, I'm a spirit, right? Of course it would be. I would expect that. But in the New Testament, where does it say God continues to have a body of spirit? It doesn't. But the, but the Father still has is, is still spirit. The Holy Spirit is still, instead of called the Holy Spirit, who is yeah, God. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a body either. The Holy Spirit is a being of spirit. He has a body there's of spirit. Nothing, there's nothing in Scripture that says the Father has spirit either. Nothing in the Scripture says the Father does not have a physical body. Right. There's right. No, so no, if Joseph Smith reveals as a prophet that the Father does in fact have a spirit, physical body that doesn't conflict with scripture we just agreed to that no i would i would, I would agree with you there you no, can I disagree would. now but earlier you said if a prophet reveals something that doesn't contain in scripture and then it it doesn't conflict with it that's your standard okay. then maybe that could be truth right right so joseph right. smith is telling the people at the king follett uh funeral Hey, even God, like Jesus Christ, laid down his life and took it up again. But he must have been God when he did that, because every teaching of Joseph Smith, he talks about the eternal nature of the Father and the Son. They have eternally been God. This idea that's often imposed upon Mormonism. That was, so was, 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 the Father God, was the Father God when he incarnated? Yes, he would have had to have been, because he laid down his life and took it up again. Okay. So he was eternally God even before he became a man. Right. Well, why is he say right here? I want to say how, how God came to be God. I thought you were right. God. Because was Jesus Christ God? Was he like the Father before he was resurrected? Yes. The answer to that question is no. Yes. God in is. It God says is. that Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That by receiving his body, if you read John 17, he's telling God to give him the glory that he had before the world was. Bring me back up and give me the glory that I had with you before the world was. Jesus glory. Separate the divine nature when he incarnated. He's what now? You can't separate the divine nature from Christ when in his mortal form before he resurrected. He was God <laughs> then, God afterwards. Right. Right, but he wasn't like the father until after his resurrection. No, he was still like the father. <laughs> he was like the father in many ways, but he was not like the father because he had not yet obtained a physically resurrected body. If what you're telling me is true, Joseph Smith is a horrible communicator because I'm reading this. You know, no, well, no, Joseph Smith was very, very clear in the King's in the King Follett sermon. <laughs> what you're doing is you're reading. You're reading the first verse where it says God was not always God, which is what everybody always says. And then they fail to continue to read for him to explain well, what he was talking that. about. You read that to me. I still don't see that interpretation. being. I know you out. don't because you don't want to. No, I don't see it. OK, let's 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 do it again. I'll screen share again and we'll look at it again. I got it right here. I can read. I should let's read, a, let's read a little higher. Let's, let's read the start, which is I wish I was in a suitable place to tell it. That's right after it does right here, because that's right here. God himself, the father has, of us all dwell on earth, the same as Jesus Christ did. Now I'll show it from the Bible. Right. Right. Okay, I can see that now. It's much, much more clear. He's not. He does not teach that God was not always God any more than he teaches that Christ was not always God. But why is he saying that God came to be God? Because he's talking about God being united with his physically resurrected body. He's talking about death and the resurrection. Well, he takes very horrible language to communicate the, that. If you read the, the whole sermon, took him like three hours to deliver. If you read the, and, and actually what most people do is they pull up LDS.org and they read King Follett and they never read the other half of it because it's difficult to find because they're not connected. It's actually really hard to find the second half of the sermon that's much more clear and express. Is it on the Mormon app? Yeah, it's on, it's on the website. It's actually difficult to find it. Well, I have I, the website here and I have the app on my phone, so. Read the whole sermon. He is not teaching what people often think that God was not always God. He is saying that God. All right. Well, all right. You well, believe, well, 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 you're Mormon. 
I will take your interpretation, okay? I'll, I'll go ahead and take your word for it. I'm not going to tell you what your, what, your, what your church teaches. When the Mormons come back next week, I'll inform them that they, what they told them to, And you know what? And tell them to call me because it's a very common problem, even in the church. Because church members will be like, yeah, God was a normal dude like us. No, there is nothing in our doctrine that states that, ever. People believe okay. that. I, just like... I will be Listen, because like, I'm not a Mormon. And well, I, no, no, but just just like you can talk to Catholics who have no idea what Catholic theology is. In fact, it's funny. You seem to be a little <laughs> bit more informed. I talked to Catholics and I said, do you know what the Immaculate Conception is? And what do you think they immediately tell me? Um, they usually refer to it. Well, OK, I've heard two answers on this. I've heard them say that I mean, that, she, that, her, uh, her, uh, that her mother was sinless and then her mother was sinless. And then I've heard people say that she didn't have the ability to sin. No, wait, wait. You're, you're, you're getting more intelligent answers than I get. They believe it's referring to the actual conception of Jesus. No, because yeah. He was yeah. immaculately conceived <laughs> because he's a virgin birth. They don't even know that it refers to Mary. I actually have to sit and explain to Catholics that immaculate conception has to do with the conception of Mary, not Jesus, yeah. so that yeah. the mother of God could escape the taint of original sin, so it didn't transmit to Jesus as he was born from her womb. Right? It's actually funny because um, in the Orthodox Church, because now I'm not Orthodox, right? I, I just been attending one because my friend wants me to, and I told him I make a lot of study, but I got like an Orthodox study Bible right here. Um, it's funny because they actually hate the Immaculate Conception. They say it is actually disrespectful to Mary because both the Orthodox and the Catholics believe she was sinless. But the Immaculate Conception teaches that she was born without the ability to sin. They say that actually destroys her glory because if she, it, there's, no, there's no honor and glory in somebody who didn't even have a passive sin. In the Orthodox Church, she had the same temptations and struggles, but she overcame them through her purity. And so in her eyes, this gives her more glory and the Catholics actually diminish it. So that sounds like semi-Pelagianism as it replies to Mary, right? I believe so. Yeah. No, no, that's basically I mean, she, she, she lived a sinless life or whatever. I, I don't. So Mormons reconcile that because we just don't believe in original sin. Mm -hmm. We just reject exactly. the concept of original sin because the right. idea of original sin makes no sense. Why right. would I be responsible and be born as a sinner because of what my parents did? I Especially think there's actually, it's 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 even more problematic when you take into account that people don't believe you pre-existed. See, for Latter Day Saints, we believe in a pre-existence, and so we believe that you actually could sin in the pre-existence, which is how we interpret John's the question of the apostles to Christ of who did sin this man or his parents that he was born blind. Yeah, and yeah, so it's, it's, their yeah. understanding is that it was possible to have sinned before a person was born. Yeah, I'm I'm much I'm much more well read on Catholicism and Orthodoxy. I'm I'm learning Mormonism right now. And I told and listen, I, I'm gonna be honest with you. I told these Mormons, listen, I don't believe in Mormonism, but I want to make sure I actually learn your church before I condemn it. I don't think it's fair to condemn something I don't I don't know enough about. Well, it's, I know, it's, but it's, that's that's already having the presupposition to condemn it. I'm going to condemn it. I just don't feel like I know enough to fully well, do it yet. Well, let me tell you why I told them. Pride is an incredibly stupid thing to have in theology. Because no matter how much you may like not like something, no how much pride you fill yourself with, it won't change objective reality. It won't. And no matter how much I believe the sky isn't there, it's there. <laughs> so, and considering the, the gravity of being wrong in this in this field, it, it's not worth having. And I came to Christ in 2019, in the spring of 2019. That's when I officially accepted Christ. Um, I've been studying theology about two years now, about two and a half years now. So. I'm just trying to figure out where Christ is and how can I get to him. Yeah, that's all I care about, you know. Well, and I'll, I'll tell you this. So here's here's the general story for Mormons is we reject and we believe it is a sign of the apostasy that a Bible was created in the first place. Now, we accept the Bible as scripture, but the problem with it is, is we do not accept a closed canon. The concept that, that early Christians decided to close the canon – as we see evidenced by, you know, Athanasius's festal letters and, you know, the Council of Rome or the identified text of the canon, those those historical events we see as the church progressing towards effectively closing the heavens. So then you, you've got the interpretations of texts like Hebrews. Hebrews doesn't say that there's not going to be any more prophets because if it said that, who's writing the rest of the New Testament? Prophets. Right. 
So to say that, so, and, and it's really funny because when you say that to people, it's almost like people believe the Bible was all written, you know, like at once. And, and oh, it was written decades. Well, Latter-day Saints, I often sound like an atheist, like you asked me if I was, if I was even a Christian. Now, I, 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 I acknowledge that I am a Christian, but I do so under the very general definition of the term. Because usually what I ask is I ask the person who's t- asking me that, what do you think a Christian is? And then they identify all this baggage that I have to accept to be a Christian. Well, if I don't accept the baggage, then I guess I'm not a Christian, and that's fine. I'm willing to, to give that to them. Are you familiar with the Council of Nicaea? Like, what was, what, what was it about? Like, no, all? Yeah. Yeah, because basically we had Arius, and he was the one that yeah. taught that Jesus was yeah, his they were, they were rejecting the, you know, the, Arian, you know, the Arian controversy. Yeah, yeah. But, but the funny thing is, there's actually a lot of conspiracies around that. They think that, you know, that the Catholic Church was made in Nicaea, Constantine, you know. No. He made the, Constantine was actually an Arian. He actually rejected oh. the Catholic position. Yeah, and, and, the, and the Arian position is not fully representative of what we believe God is. Well, I don't think all are Arians. I think they're tritheists. You know. Well, we're not. We wouldn't be tritheists either because we don't believe just in three gods. We we're, we would be henotheists. Three gods. What? You worship three gods. We don't worship three gods. We only worship one. Okay, so you're okay. So you, you so more accurate call you henotheists. We're we're we, we're henotheists more specifically to practice monolatry. Okay. All right. Oh, I, I, well, like, yeah, like, we only we, we only worship the Father. Okay. The, yeah, because, I was so, so look at it, look at it this way. We believe that there's gods, and so all those passages where it talks about one God and one God and one God. First of all, a lot of those are post-exilic passages, so they're relational to the idea that there were creeping up idols. And what God is saying is, there's no gods that you can form. You can't make a god. You know, you can create stuff out of stone and wood and whatever, but it's not a god, right? And I am right. God. I am the only God with whom you should have any dealings. His, his, his language is more relational to his covenant with the children of Israel. He's not de- rejecting the idea that there could be other divine beings or other beings that could be called gods. What he's saying is, is I am preeminent and I am the one whom you should worship. So that's how Latter-day Saints view those. And that's actually the better historical interpretation of those texts. Because ancient Israelites, they, they weren't mon- monotheists. The idea of monotheism didn't creep in until the last couple hundred years before Christ was was born. Do you um? Wait, so do you, do you believe that those other gods were eternal or were they created? No, that's the thing. Is so we don't we don't believe in creatio ex nihilo either. So we we believe everything's always existed. God God okay. forms. Yeah. See, we reject okay. creatio ex nihilo, which is another concept not found in the Bible. Creatio ex nihilo is not in the Bible. Okay, so this is actually more so basically like universe is an eternal place so that God's been existing in forever, right? Yes, and that's why that's why the idea that God became God makes no sense to Latter Day Saints who understand the theology because you he doesn't become God; he's been God. Now, does he go from one state of being to the other? Yes, and we see that in the person of Jesus. So Jesus is okay, the so- physical manifestation of what the Father is. So we we as okay. Latter Day Saints we don't see any distinction between the Father and the Son and as as far as as what you, what you say ontologically what they are. Okay, so this is actually where we actually like this is where me and the in those missionaries uh, I asked them this question. Is the, no, not, not the one I'm talking to now is the is the older ones from Canada. Yeah, they they uh, they actually brought in a bunch of elders like older members in because I asked this question they couldn't find an answer for it. So they said they believe the universe is the eternal place that always existed. And I asked them to explain how that's possible. They said, what do you mean? I'm like, well, the universe is a temporal entity. I think you'd agree time exists. And so basically, if the universe was infinite, right, it always existed. Let's say right here, this is zero. This is, well, for your perspective, this is negative one, negative two. This is one, two, right? So this, this is tomorrow. It's the day after. This is yesterday and day before that. So if the universe was always existing and time's always existed, you'd have an infinite number of negative numbers going down from zero to infinity. So in order to get to the present, you'd have to count down from infinity to zero. How do you plan on doing that? So that's that's the issue. Is That's where when it talks about my ways are higher than your ways and stuff, that's the problem. So what happens is, is in the Latter-day Saint scripture, for example, in the Doctrine and Covenants, it says that all, all, all of everything is matter. 
Mm-hmm. You know, spirit is matter. Everything is matter. And so the existence and the eternal nature of the universe, that's where you have an issue because anybody who represents, for example, that Neptune has always been Neptune, that's not true. No, God not. forms God forms things from existing things. You can't make something from nothing, which is another pr- principle of physics. You can't have nothing and then create something. You have well, to have existing stuff. And throughout the... Well, Throughout the Bible, the idea of create is more in the is more accurately, and everybody likes create because by the the development of the King James canon, for example, the concept of creatio ex nihilo had become well established in the church. The problem with it is, is in the Hebrew canon, the the word create means to shape or to form. It doesn't right. mean to create from nothing. It, it, well, well, like I said before, we still like I would agree you can't get something on nothing. Now there. But you will no, no, you wouldn't because you would believe there's God and there was nothing and God can blink and there's something. Well, there now we, we get into science here now. Don't quote me. I could be wrong. I, I, do it. And I don't know. So so Latter-day Saints believe this. We believe all true science circumscribes within all th- true religion. The problem right. with it is, is all true science and all true religion is still unknown to man. We do not have all of the pieces to put it all together. And and unfortunately, we probably never will in this life because if we did, we would not walk by faith. Are you familiar with the Kalam cosmological argument at all? I'm sure you have. The Kalam cosmological argument. I'm I'm sure you are. It's it's very famous. I've not, maybe, I I maybe am. I've never heard that term. Well, it was, well, it was originally a Greek philosophy that was popularized by a Muslim named Kalam. Um, Basically, it, it goes with these premises. All things that begin to exist have a cause. Nothing can come into being without a cause. Two, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. That's that's the basic premise, right? Right. So basically what I'm getting at is nothing can come into existence without a cause, right? Like let's say this this, this can didn't just bleep into existence, right? right. And a cause or made it. And so basically you you have either you either have a, a first cause, an unmoved mover, which we call God. Or you have an infinite regress, which we call a fallacy in 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 in, in schools of logic, because you know it's infinite regress of like time. Can't, you can't, you can't of, yeah. So so the idea is, I don't believe in an infinite regression. I, I I also believe that that's that's the fallacy. The problem with it is, is to say that there's an uncaused cause that that God couldn't exist coeternally with stuff, and that's all we can call it. It's stuff. So right. the issue with that is, is that theologically, what that do is that does is that absolves God as being the source of evil. See, well, he's not the source of evil. He is. Yeah, he, no, he created all no, things. No, no, no. Go, go, he created all things, including evil. God didn't create evil. He created the possibility of evil. Right. Like, what, what, what is God's? What, what is God? What? But well, let, let me explain this to you. What? No, he creates the possibility of evil. Let me put it this way. God, get, do you believe in free will? No, I so Latter Day Saints actually do believe in free will. Nobody else right. does, but we do. Well, we believe in free will in, in my church as well. But anyway, you, you, um, you really, you, you know, you think you do, but no, 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 we're, we're not Calvinist. <laughs> no, no, I, I know, but even Arminians and and others don't really believe in free will I'm not because they do. because they believe in creatio ex nihilo. They can't believe in free will. They believe that they are what God made them. Well, let's not get stuck in the nitty gritties of, of, of the definitions there. But what I'm getting at is, if free will exists, right, then evil must be possible to exist as well. Because if there's no possibility, no possibility of evil, then there's no free will. Right, but but the problem with that is, is that for there to be evil, God must have created a mind that understood and chose evil. And because he created the thing that, cre- so it's kind of the analogy, the only analogy that I've ever come up with that's even remotely relevant to it is if I, if I, and granted again, let's say that I could, let's say from nothing, I could create a bridge and I'm a bridge builder. Mm-hmm. I show up on the bridge, I'm a wizard or whatever the hell you want to call it. And I wave my wand and a bridge appears and the bridge collapses. Mm-hmm. Who's responsible for the collapsing the bridge? Mm-hmm. I am. So if right. God creates you from nothing and blinks you into existence, you are what he made you. What, what is evil in your definition? Define yeah, evil. So, for, so for Latter-day Saints, because we believe we are co-eternal with God, and what God does is God helps us to transition 
from one state of being into a greater state of being in the process of trying to make us like himself. So God is truly altruistic because his goal is to make all things like himself. And he is the first one of that. He is the uncaused, pre-existing God, eternal God. He is capable of taking other existing things and making them like himself. Right? He is well, the one who can do that. So in process of doing that, what he does is he grants you choice. So we believe that one of the things that Satan did that rebelled against God is he was given the opportunity to enter mortality with a physical body, and he rejected that idea. And the reason he rejected that idea, according to Travis, is that entering into a mortality and suffering the mortal life sounded less godly to him. So he came up with an alternative scenario, and his alternative scenario was, Let's just go down there and I'll make everybody do what I want. And then I'll be God because I have a better plan. And God's like, your plan rejects free will. So for me, for, for Latter-day Saints, because I, my brain, Travis, has always existed, God didn't create the possibility of evil or create an inclination that I have to evil. What he created is opportunities. He said, look, if you will do X, I will give you Y. And if you choose B, A, you get B. So do you want X or A? And then that leads to B or Y. That's what you get. So for us, God is not malevolent or malicious. He is a grantor of opportunities and a giver of blessings. He doesn't, and then, so damnation <laughs> is simply choosing A, over X. Right. And so what people do is they get into these whole arguments about like the Trinity and, and whether or not the Bible alone is God's word. And so to, for Latter-day Saints, as a Latter-day Saint, what I view that as and the way I perceive that is what you're doing is you're taking an expansive concept that could give you more knowledge and you're narrowing the field down to simply, I only have the Bible as my scripture. There's only one God. I cannot become a God. I can't become like the Heavenly Father. And in consequence of doing that, let me ask you this, William. What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? Glorify God. That's the problem. So here's so let's let's take that answer. How are we glorified? What do you mean, like, what do you mean, what do you mean how do we glorify God? How does how does my we glorify. We, we always like to glorify God. We glorify God through our works. We glorify God, God through our through our faith. We glorify God by our sanctification, repentance. So, so now what you're saying is you're saying, and 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 the only way I can view that is in, in an abstract way. God is happy because you do what He says or whatever, right? We live according to His will. You yes. Worship Him, and and but see, the thing is for me is look at it this way. That sounds really human right where well, you're looking you're looking at praise as, as, a, as a form of compliment not a form of love have for you example, seen wait wait have you seen that? hang on i'll let you I'll let you talk for a bit no, you're fine um, let me ask you a question um are you married or are you seen are you have a girlfriend or whatever i've been married for 20 years all right so i imagine you, you say nice things about your about your wife right i try to right so what's <laughs> i'm actually getting engaged myself i'm getting married this year so <laughs> um so Praise is a natural consequence of love. So God wants you to love him. And as we love God, we praise God. That's what God's ultimate goal wants for us, is he wants us to love him and follow his teachings. God wants what's best for you. Sin is sin, not because God's like, oh, I don't like that. It's sin because it, it's actually damaging towards your soul, right? It's like, for example, why is Islam such a bad religion? It's very carnal. Things like right. sex and wine and men, and these things aren't inherently bad themselves. Right. But if you try and fill yourself up with these things, these worldly pleasures, you're going to burn out your soul to satisfy. I I, I know. I no. So no, no, it's it's side note. I'm just I'm just going to. I I know a lot of Muslims, and they're not that way, and that's not really what they believe. But I, I get what you're saying. I do understand well, where you're getting that. Well, I, I get it. That's actually what the scriptures teach. I'm not going to get into a theological argument over Islam, but the reality <laughs> of it is, is this. So look at it this way. God, God, and let me, 
God is 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 not creating in the same sense where where our so so look at John 17 and read it really carefully because what Christ is saying is I had glory with you before the world was I gave up that glory so that I could glorify you further yes he he took on now, a human he's a human form and then he says because I am glorifying you now give me the glory which I had with you before mm -hmm. the world was then he turns to the apostles and he says and glorify them that they mm -hmm. might glorify you further so mm -hmm. our concept of that is is that again taken from the premise that god is the penultimate being in the universe and has the capacity to provide opportunity for progression to mm -hmm. all other existing intelligences what this does is this this answers the question of why didn't God just just destroy Satan when he rebelled? Well, mm -hmm. he didn't destroy Satan when he rebelled because up to that point, Satan had complied with the requirements of progression. He had kept mm -hmm. God's commandments. Then he rejects God and he is cast out. Yeah. God does not destroy. He can't make something nothing. He can't. Actually, he can. In scripture, it so, says he's a power to destroy a soul. Like right. He's a power to destroy your soul. It's in scripture. I, I understand that, but the destruction of the soul is not to uncreate it or to make it not not existing anymore. Why, so why say, say that? It, it's to it's to it's to separate it from himself, to cast it out of his light or out of his glory, out of his presence. It's not really to. to that's a to weird way. To, that's a weird way to write that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's, it's not. That's not really. I'm really I'm just gonna take, just send you away. So, so they didn't really understand. So, and the problem with it is, in the ancient world, they didn't understand the idea of something could be created from nothing, or something could be destroyed and made into nothing. That didn't really – so a lot of the Bible is, is misunderstood by modern, modern thinkers because philosophically we've developed other ideals that we impose on the biblical text. And we don't go back and look at what ancient peoples looked at. I've got a really good friend who – he studies ancient history, and that's kind of what his issues are. Is he's like, people misunderstand the Bible because they don't even know who the people are that wrote it. And they don't understand what they were thinking when it was written. So e either way, let's just go from the premise that – we did pre-exist and we can't be we can't be created and we can't be uncreated. With that said, God can only he can only give you options and when you choose the options, you pursue the path that's that's representative of that option, right? So as all, every step along the way to become like the Father, we choose. We chose to come to earth. We we chose to obey God. We chose to right. stay with God. We chose to follow God, right? And as we choose those things, we become more like God. Until eventually, we become exactly like God. Right. We, well, yeah, because we, we sanctify and, and we fulfill the Holy Spirit, and we're called to be like God, right? Right. But, what, but here's what, the issue. The difference is, is that for, for most Christians, God is a separate thing. And I use the word thing because he's not like us. The idea of God's fatherhood, his adoption, is more like if I go to the, and it's, it's crass, but it, it's true. It's like if I go to the pound and adopt a dog, the dog is my child and I am its father. It can love me and it can act like me and follow me around, but it can never be me. Right. Saturday well, saints believe we are literally the same thing as God. We are what he is. And we have that same capacity and potential. So the reason that we're on earth is to execute one portion of our progression by receiving a physical body. And so the King Follett sermon was delivered in that context. So let me ask you a question. So if I reject God, can I still become a God? You will be, you will be more a God regardless of what you do in this life. You will be more a God when you die. Because everybody receives resurrection, because the resurrection was promised when you agreed to enter mortality. I don't it, think I ever agreed to anything, but all right. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. I believe that pre. So, so here's the other thing: is if we didn't agree to this shithole that we all live in, God imposed it on us. Well, so if if, if I'm if I have the capacity to become like God, right, and he's we're, we're the same creature, I guess you can call it. Could that mean I could overthrow God if I gain the power? No. 
Why not? Like, like why? Because, is he more because, yeah. And that's where, yeah. So you think about it this way at every stage, we are tested in the, in the, in the book of Abraham, it says we will prove them to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord, their God shall command them. The issue with it is, is do you think Jesus is good? So keep in mind, we believe that they are separate beings. Can the son overthrow the father? No. Well, at least not in my theology, no. Because no. they're all the same. And, and, and nor could he or would he in my theology because he is the father, meaning they are the same. They are one. Like modalism? No, no, no. They are one <laughs> in the sense that they are so perfectly aligned and in harmony with one another that You're they afraid. actually, they're, they're, you can replace them with each other. So okay. scriptures that talk about the Father and the Son and the Son and the Father, there's a whole bunch of theology behind that. But the reality of it is, is that they are so like each other that Christ subordinates himself to the Father as an act of will. And he accepted his role as the atoning sacrifice. And so hmm. he condescended and then he was exalted and glorified by doing right. that. And so will he will he go in and say, hey, hey, God, get off your throne. It's my turn to sit there. No, because he recognizes that that is part of his perfection is his subordination to the father. So when, when they talk about, for example, and I don't I don't necessarily know or believe this, but mm -hmm. when we talk about people, we, you know, they're like, you know, Mormons think they're going to become gods of their own worlds. We would, if, if that's true, if God does allow us to participate in the creative act of organizing matter, what we would do is we would surrender the glory of those worlds to the Father and he would be glorified. See, so in our estimation, basically your glory that you give to God is, is inconsequential to him. It doesn't, it doesn't change anything about God. He doesn't right. need you. But see, for Latter-day Saints, and I'm not saying it's one is better than the other. They're just simple, simply different beliefs. The idea is, is that we have always existed. And by making us like himself, by providing the means by which we can do that, God's glorifying us and a glorified being giving worship to the Father adds to his glory because he is the source of that glory. We, 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 we take from the Father his glory, and he is glorified as we are there and after glorified. Does that make sense? I was, I was going to go back to something real quickly here, So because I didn't really get a, an answer for it. At least I, if I did, I, 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 I must have misheard you. Um, okay, so I drew this out for you. Sorry, I was, I was ignoring you. I was just drawing something here. So I did a, I did a little diagram here. So like, time issue because like we say time matters eternal but we can't have eternal time because we go back like this is yesterday the day before that day before that all the way down to infinity we can't reach zero because the it, the past was infinite you'd always have another day to go through before you get today H how do you address that I, I i don't because time is a moral construct it's a moral time God, God lives, you know, the scriptures, the Doctrine and Covenants, for example, is very clear. God, God's, the, the past, present, and future are one eternal round for God. So the way that I would, the way that I would fix that, it's, is not a line, it's not a line, it's a circle. God has explained that for him, all things are one eternal round. I don't know what you'd call that, and I don't know well, what that I would agree that God, 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 well, I believe. And what the scripture look, the scriptures hint at this in the uh, epistle of Peter is that God exists outside of time. He's not part of the universe. He's outside the universe. That's what we believe. It's it basically and, and, uh, and Latter Day yeah, Saints. So Latter Day Saint theology wouldn't really comment on that because whether or not God exists outside of the known universe, whether He pulls existing materials from outside and puts them in whether he in four cases that in something and then he he dwells in whatever we know very general concepts god doesn't speak to humans in ways other than what he thinks they can understand so for example where i dwell is everlasting burnings well what does that mean i don't know what the hell that means but that's the best god can do to explain to us where he lives 
I live in a place of everlasting burnings. It's like fire. Right. And we're like, oh, okay. Like being in fire all the time. And he's like, sure, that'll work. And the reason is, is he can't really convey it to us because we're not him. We're not glorified. Well, well, I was going to, no, this isn't really a rebuttal. It's more of a thought uh, experiment for you. Well, not thought experiment, that's not the right word. An idea. There he goes. An idea for you. So there is a way you can have God, scientifically speaking, in a universe with no matter in it, right? Because we, we, we believe God's infinite, right? His power is in tent, he's omniscient. No, I believe God has limitations. God's limited. Well, what do you mean by limited? We can't lie. He can't, he okay. can't do absurd. Okay. Okay. Basically, basically, what you believe is you believe in the more appropriate definition of omnipotence because right. there's, 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 there's a misconception. Omnipotence okay. is so, so, so people often say God knows everything. And I say, no, God knows everything that can be known. You guys, so you're, you're prescribed the, the, the more traditional definition of omnipotence which doesn't mean the power to do anything, but the power to do anything logically coherent. Like God no, can't make it. God's, God's not going to make, make the world nonsensical because well, well, we have to live in it and he can't make it. Not, he can't make the universe and everything nonsensical. It has to have order. God is not a God of chaos. God of doesn't contradict his nature. Right. Okay. Yeah, he, he doesn't make rocks like so. He doesn't make rocks too big. He can't lift them. He doesn't. Yeah, that kind of. Crap. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've heard that. I've, I've heard that nonsense. That's a, yeah, it's, it's, nonsense. I, 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 uh, red pen logic. I think it's a change yeah. in my life. Yeah, uh, he actually, like, can God make make a blue pen? That's that. You know, can he make blue red ink? I mean. Yeah, yeah. It's like can, can he make a, can, can he make a square triangle? Right. Yeah. Can make, yeah. <laughs> okay, can so, do anything. so the thing is that, that's why I say God knows what can be known. Yeah. Well, what I was getting at was, um, is a this is this isn't a refutation. It's just an idea. Um, there is a not a doctrine, an idea in science, and this is actually proposed by Einstein, according to the first law of thermodynamics, that you can actually take energy and convert it to matter. So you could have a situation where God is literally all that exists at any point, and through His own energy, His own power, He creates, He converts that power into matter. Right. Is one way from a scientific perspective, because basically the reason why I'm bringing this up is to reconcile the the the, the time problem is is matter. If, if time hasn't always existed, then neither does space or matter, right? And so God could create time, space, and matter depending how you just depending how you find space through His own energies, right? right. And that's one way to look at it. it, it it's not I, a reputation. I it's think a, so. My my issue with that is with with the with the, the parallels and the, the the attempts to kind of reconcile. I think that a lot of Christians make big mistakes when they try to borrow from scientific principles and shoehorn them into religion, because religion is not is not scientific. Religion no. has no base. Right. So so tr well, and and what, and what the reason I'm saying this is. The, the problem with it is, is that God is God. And so to some degree, I believe that to a large degree, God can be understood because he has revealed himself in Christ. But see, I also take science and religion and I tear them apart because I recognize that eventually all true science and all true religion will, will merge back together. But as it okay. says right now, watching it, Watching atheist scientists argue a different epistemology than theology and watching theologians. In fact, I've got a call I'm supposed to do with some missionaries tomorrow with an agnostic guy who's trying to shoehorn objective scientific research into religion. And I'm like, religion is a choice. I choose to believe in God. Right. Because of feelings. It's all feelings. So and one of the things I was getting at, William, with the Bible is. You believe the Bible is what it is because you believe it. It's not because it's not because it objectively has objective objectivity to it. Well, well, well let me explain why I believe in the Bible because it, it's actually not why I believe in the Bible. I actually didn't want to believe in the Bible because I was a sinner. I had, I love my pornography. I love my fornication. I love my drinking. And I did not want to give that up. So for the longest time, until about two years ago, now two years before that, I was, I was a Christian, sure, but I worshipped an idol, right? I basically put God below me and said, "Well, the Bible is corrupted. We can't trust Israel, my men. You know, I'm sure God doesn't care if I'm having sex with my girlfriend. I love her. It's, it's it's beautiful sex, you know, things like that, right?" And so I came to believe the Bible because I came to believe in God. And there's a and, and a lot of things led up to it. 
for example, um, I actually kind of believe in God listening to uh, arguments, like cosmological arguments. So I'm sure you're familiar with William Lane Craig. He's a, he's a brilliant uh, theologian on that matter. Yeah. He actually popularized the Kalam argument, wrote a book on it. And as I go through these logical arguments, I have actually come to believe it's not possible for a universe to exist outside of God, because then you have a problem. You either believe the universe created itself or always existed. Right. And then, now, granted, I know you may, the, I know you, I know Mormons believe that believe they all exist, but also because problem. No, no, I don't believe the universe as we know it has always existed. All I know is that God okay. used, God okay. used existing matter, including our intelligences, and He shapes those materials to make what we see in the natural world. Okay, so that's the problem. Is is if you can't see something, does it exist? And just well, because you can't see something, does that mean there's nothing there? Right. See, so well, that's, well, that's the problem. So we know that, that, that spirit is matter, but it is refined matter that we cannot perceive with our natural senses. But God can see it. Right? God can perceive it. And so why can't he use it to shape? So that's the problem is that there, William Lane Craig makes a lot of arguments where he tries to use objectivity and subjectivity and merge them. And I, I appreciate his intelligence. Obviously, the guy is brilliant. But I think that some of his, his uh, arguments are predicated on the, on the idea that he can make an argument so sound that God exists. And the reality of it is, is God exists to the individual believer because they choose to accept him. There's no objectivity because a person equally as intelligent can refute those same arguments with equally logically plausible arguments. I've watched people do it. I mean, William Lane Craig specifically chooses, for example, his debate opponents so that he can demonstrate what he demonstrates. And the problem with them is, is again, the debates are never very good because they're arguing from different epistemologies. But the reality of it is, is that that's, that's the, the point being is like, Believing that the Gospels were written by the people ascribed to them, believing that the Bible is the Bible, believing the Scripture is Scripture, those are beliefs. People choose to accept those things, and oh, it's upon those premises. I wanted to read a verse. Yeah, I, I want to read a verse to you. Romans one, uh, chapter one, verse nineteen it says, "In reality, the truth of God is known instinctively, for God embeds the knowledge inside every human heart." And see, and, 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 I, and, I, and I get that. There's a similar passage in the Book of Mormon with Alma, where he says, all things denote that there is a God, and all things witness that there's a supreme creator. Even the planets in the regular seasons do denote that there's a supreme creator. And so the idea that there is a God and that we can intuit that God, that, again, that's just somebody's argument. That doesn't mean that that's true. Well, I, I, well, I believe what the scriptures say, because I, I believe they're inspired. Right. Again, see, and that's why I, I'm glad you said that. You believe the scriptures are the scriptures because you believe they're the scriptures. It becomes a well, circular argument. Well, All well, theological well, no, arguments. No, 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 no. This, this is not a catch-22. Um, basically, the reason why I believe this is not because they're the scriptures is because Jesus rose from the dead. And I believe that not just because the Bible says that, because I can confirm that with, with his secular history as well. We know the apostles went to their bloody death. So let me ask you a question. Are you willing to die for something new as a lie? No, in fact, the, the whole Nixon, the whole Nixon uh, Watergate scenario. Yeah, I should just by that same. I mean, that's the same argument Mormons used to prove that the Church Restoration was true. Well, no, because the Mormons were dying for something they heard. Jesus apostles were dying for something they saw. Oh no! Now, now I've heard people say I, they, they, the Book of Mormon actually testifies people who saw the golden plates, but they can't prove they know it said. So only, only Joseph Smith can read it. So they're, they're, they're taking something they heard, but they paused for dying something they saw. They no, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about Joseph and Hiram specifically. Mm -hmm. They died for what they saw, what they experienced. What they, they, saw, they, saw, they, saw, they saw the tablets, if I'm if I'm get my names correct here. Well, Joseph Smith saw God the Father and Jesus Christ and testified to that till the day he died, and he was murdered. Yeah, that, that was a private revelation, though. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so the, yeah, the idea is is that that a martyr's death can can just as equally prove that somebody actually believes that what they saw was correct. Okay. Well, when a terrorist blows himself up, he's obviously sincere, right? He obviously believes what he's dying for. Right. But he's saying that he heard from someone else. It could be true or false. No, but, but, but see that but, that doesn't that doesn't work, William. Joseph Smith is one person who claimed to have seen that. 
the apostles and 500 people claim to have seen the risen now, Christ. Now, remember, remember the sources from which you're getting those claims, though. That is Paul claiming something. The only well, witness you have for that is Paul. I would have to bring up, I'd have to go pull up the historians, also other secular so, historians. So the, the, the problem with it is, is most of the epistles in the, in the, in the Greek New Testament, most of the, the gospels are unknown as far as their authorship. Many of the, the letters of Paul, for example, you're aware of the Deutero-Pauline epistles, those that are rejected by scholars. You know, the pastoral epistles are often argued that they're not authentic. Mm-hmm. There, so there's, there's, those, there's those problems, but independent of that, Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 15 that Christ died and rose again and was seen of 500 and the apostles and myself, that's just Paul saying that. That doesn't mean that happened. Well, no, you have actually many authors saying that. Remember, 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 you, you, I'm sure you know the Bible is not a book. It's a collection of books. Right. I'm glad you said that too because the, the issue with it is, is many authors saying that, again, doesn't prove that it happened. Well, then I, People, I think but what if I took that same argument used against Joseph Smith? Well, but yet we have one author saying that. Right. No, no. You've got you. So that's the thing is the fact that there's evidences and witnesses and things for thing for, for those those right. those ideas. Um, if you read the Doctrine and Covenants, there's not a more verifiable text than the Doctrine and Covenants. What do you mean by that? Because we actually know everything in the Doctrine and Covenants. Mm-hmm. We can verify that it happened. How do you know? Because we actually have, that's contemporaneous history during a time when people kept better records. The records are only a couple hundred years old. And there's millions of pages, millions, millions of pages of documents, mm-hmm. journals and and, evident, and journals and accounts that are contemporaneous where multiple people are writing the same event, thousands of journals and hundreds of pages. And I mean, the church history archives are are a library full of these documents. So if that's sufficient to prove something, then the restoration's true because they saw angels appear over temples. They saw people raised from the dead. They saw all these great things. They saw angels and people spoke in tongues and all these accounts. That's what I'm saying. So one type of evidence applied somewhere that kind of evidence appears somewhere else also. Well, what I'm getting at is also is the, these apostles also had nothing to gain by. Joseph Smith had plenty to gain from this. He, he, he gained power what, from it. What did he gain? He gained power. How many followers he got? <laughs> you, are, you familiar with the, are you familiar with the War of the Mormons? Are happened? you familiar with these, the fact that he spent most of his life in jail? Yeah, no, I'm aware of that. He was he was labeled a, a grave robber and uh, and, and, and a um, something he else. Was, he was accused jail. of a lot of things. He was jailed yeah. over 120 times. Right. Yeah. Then he he lost. Uh, he lost, I, he lost I, I, hear, I hear conflicting reports on his death. Some he people lost say five yeah, children. Lost. He lost five children. He was beat. He was tarred and feathered. He was mm-hmm. abused. He was threatened with death. He had friends that died. He was, and eventually he was murdered. He right. never had a home of his own. He was moved from city to city to city. He spent most of his life petitioning the government for redress, help, and relief from the persecutions of the Mormon people, and it was ignored. And those are just historical facts. The reality of it is he went to Washington three times to try to get the president to help, and the president told him to stick it. He was lied to by so, two different governors, Governor Dunklin and Governor um, – We're going to have to wrap this up soon. Please. I, 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 no, no, I, you're I, fine. I, I, yeah. So if you want to take this up, the reality well, of it is I think we had kind of a, of a shotgun approach today. If you want to come up with a topic that's a little bit more tailored, we can talk about something more specific and more in-depth. Right, we can do that. Certainly, um, I was just going to ask you, um, but you you believe in the scriptures, right? That they're true. No, Make no. Sure. Let me let me real quick. So the scriptures, I believe the scriptures are inspired writings by oh. the people who claim to have written them. So you, you what, what, what I'm getting at is that you either believe they're true or you don't. Well, for example, I believe that they are what they are. So, for example, the Book of Job uh-huh. is a historical account. There was right. no Job. Uh, yeah, I, I've I've heard conflicting stories on that. I'm not, I'm, I'm still on the on the fence. Well, no, I, I've talked to I've talked to Hebrew scholars that actually laugh that people think Job is an actual account. Right. Well, what I was getting at was um, there's a passage in the Book of Daniel, Daniel seven verse thirteen through fourteen, where it talks about the Messiah's kingdom would be eternal kingdom would never pass away. 
And Mormons tell me that, well, that king was lost for 1,800 years. Is that, is that a true statement? The Messiah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to here, well, first of all, you're, you're imposing upon Daniel a <laughs> prophecy of Jesus Christ and the Messiah he's talking about is not simply a king because Messiah just means anointed one. Right. Well, well we, we, never, we never said Messiah. He says the son of man. Let's let's do that. Let's talk about our, our, our when we meet again. Let's talk about what we think the Bible is. Okay. Let's have um, your topic. Do you, have, do you have me on Facebook? Oh, no, you don't. You guys met you. I'm talking about. Why don't you go ahead and have me on Facebook so we can stay in contact? And... So let me tell you, Facebook Facebook has me on a timeout. <laughs> That's okay. I get this a lot. <laughs> So I'm my I, I so it's really weird because I've got about forty of these people because people complain about everything I say and do. Um, I do a lot of I do a lot of evangelical back and forth, and when they when they feel like they're losing the argument, they tell Facebook I'm bullying them. So um, I get I get a lot of warnings, and what they'll do is they'll block me and then they'll unblock me. But this most recent one, because I've had so many, even though they weren't valid. They've blocked me on a 30-day suspension. So I still have two weeks left on that. Yeah, I, I got a 30-day ban one time for posting a picture of SpongeBob. Yeah, so this was, well, this guy said, wait a minute, you're a Mormon. And I said, way to go, Sherlock. And because I, I put his comment over a picture of Sherlock Holmes and posted it, they thought I was bullying him, so I got blocked. <laughs> Yeah, I know how it is. Yeah, well, if, um, on Messenger or some some form of media, so, or, or yeah, so email. probably just the I can I can be reached through Messenger. Um, get the missionaries, and we'll we'll connect. Okay, yeah, go ahead and uh, probably for, for a few days before, the, before we do our discussion, go ahead and send me the topics. So I can make sure I research okay, it. We'll do it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I mean again, not a debate. We're just so <laughs> I like quoting scriptures back and forth to me is useless because. The only thing you can tell me, William, is what you think the verse means. Right. And I'm going to tell you I disagree, and this is what I think it means. Right. So, And I'm a pretty pragmatic person as far as I, I really view the Bible very practically. Yeah. Well, all right. All right. Talk to you later. Well, Have a good well, one. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.